Coffee became a part of the standard U.S. Army ration in 1832, thanks to President Andrew Jackson. Now, before you get too grateful, remember, Jackson substituted coffee for the soldier's alcohol ration. Now, as many of us know, caffeine is an excellent stimulant, and Civil War soldiers were no less addicted than people are today to coffee. In fact, even the most religious coffee drinker of today would be hard-pressed to compete with the Civil War soldier in their addiction to caffeine. Like many people, the Civil War soldier began his day with coffee. If there was an early morning march, the first order of business was to boil water and make coffee and get it consumed before getting into line. If there was a halt along the march, the first order of business when the march stopped was to get that hot water going to drink more coffee. In fact, one Union veteran recorded that Civil War soldiers would drop out of the line of march, start a fire, boil up some coffee, and drink some more before they got back in the line and catch up with the rest of their comrades. Soldiers going on picket duty would drink coffee before they went out, and soldiers would drink coffee after their shift ended. Put another way, soldiers drank coffee at meals and between meals. Bear in mind that these troops did not have the same access to sugar that we do today. Oh sure, they were issued sugar, but not nearly in large enough quantities to match the sheer volume of coffee they consumed. In order to help their sugar ration go further, Civil War soldiers would keep their coffee and their sugar in the same bag, so that every sip of coffee had just a tiny taste of sugar with it. Also, remember that milk is a luxury during the Civil War in both armies. They could occasionally get condensed milk in cans from sutlers for a very high price, or perhaps they could stop at a farm here like the Muma farm in Antietam and squeeze milk from a local cow. But these were very rare occurrences. So picture this, most Civil War soldiers are drinking their coffee black with only the tiniest hint of sugar in every drop. Think about that the next time you order your caramel soy macchiato. Unfortunately for Confederate troops, the Union blockade of southern ports greatly hampered the Confederacy's ability to import coffee and sell it for a reasonable price, let alone issue it to troops in the field. As early as January of 1862, coffee rations to Confederate soldiers had to be suspended entirely. British observer Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fremantle noted in his now famous diary that Confederates exercised their ingenuity in devising substitutes for coffee, grinding up roots and vegetables into a coffee-like substance. Colonel Fremantle admitted, however, that these substitutes were not generally very good. Rye was a popular placeholder, if somewhat dangerous. A rye typically grows along other more poisonous plants, prompting one Richmond newspaper to warn that poisoning is inevitable when drinking rye coffee. Another less poisonous substitute was chicory, which had the benefit of not killing anybody, but also lacked the caffeine content. However, the flavor profiles were similar enough that starting in Louisiana and then spreading across the South, Southerners would use chicory in place of coffee. Chicory remained a popular coffee substitute through the Great Depression and into the 20th century, and is even being infused into bougie coffee blends today. Northerners, on the other hand, had a much easier time of getting coffee, making it a prized commodity to trade during the informal truces that often sprung up between Union and Confederate soldiers on the picket line. Very typically, Union soldiers would trade Northern coffee for Southern tobacco, with both sides being pleased with the result. 